Good evening and thanks for joining us for another edition of Resource PNG. Tonight we feature two reports, one on the Oil Search AGM and the other on the joint venture between InterOil and Pacific LNG Group. We also talk exclusively to the Gulf Governor about the recent deal. We'll also have the Resource News update from Martin Namorong. But first, here is a report on Oil Search's AGM on the 2012 financial year. Oil Search held its AGM for the 2012 financial year recently, topping off what has been a year of mixed results. Whilst there was a solid share price performance and a net profit after tax of 175.8 million US dollars, cash costs have increased and production declined by 5%. Those against? The motion is carried and congratulations Fiona. At its peak, the share price traded at $8.25 before easing to trade above $8.15. Generally, key performance indicators for 2012 were flat compared to 2011. Oil search eased from 6.69 million barrels of oil equivalent in 2011 to 6.38 million barrels of oil equivalent. There was also a 1.13% drop in sales. This had an impact on revenue with total income for 2012 being 724.6 million US dollars compared to 732.9 million dollars the previous years. If I touch on the 2012 results, production was reasonably flat uh, 2011 to 2012, about 6.4 million barrels. If we do nothing in our oil business, the decline in our oil will go down about 20% a year. But because we've been successful in drilling more oil, finding more oil, we can keep that production pretty flat and we will intend to do so out through 2013 into 14. With mature oil fields steadily declining, the company is optimising the productivity of its oil business, with additional drilling activity generating approximately 500 million US dollars in additional value. The discovery of additional oil pools has increased the lifespan of the fields and helped maintain higher production levels. The previous operator Chevron Texaco said that uh, the Gobi oil field would be shut down in 2009 and Kudabu somewhere in the 2011-2012 time frame. With this investment and the ongoing uh, development of PNGLNG, we now see at least 30 more years uh, of operations in the oil fields, a substantial add value to not just oil search, but also the country. Our oil fields and our activities in our oil fields are highly profitable. They represent high returning pieces of business and we, we will continue to reinvest heavily in those oil fields. Although the size of the oil pools are not large, they do give us a very, very healthy return. And the oil fields are very important in supporting PNG LNG operations. With maturing oil assets, the company sees the future in terms of creating synergies between the oil fields and the PNG LNG project. Recent appraisal work of the Pinyang gas field suggests that 2.5 and 3 trillion cubic feet of gas. This along with exploration of the Flinders and Hagana wells in the Gulf of Papua are set to underpin LNG expansion in PNG and growth in oil searches business. As I mentioned, this is a really, really exciting time to be involved in oil search. We're undergoing very, very substantial change, unprecedented growth in our business. Over the next uh, two and a half years, we'll quadruple our production, quadruple our revenue streams, and uh, a very substantial uh, base for the future of our business and our shareholders in terms of value growth will be further established and delivered. It's a really, really exciting time. PNG LNG will transform us and transform the country. We're carrying out the largest ever appraisal and exploration program we've ever done in the country. We've had some early success, which gives us confidence around further growth, especially in the LNG world. With prospects for growth on the upside, all search is firmly committed to spreading their benefits throughout the community. 
Aside from the usual resource benefits of royalties, tax credit schemes, and business development opportunities for landowners, Old Search has an expanding public health program. The financial and social changes that are taking place in the country are enormous. And we do have to be mindful that we have to play our role in, in making sure we as a major corporate citizen here have and continue to build on an, our, uh, our uh, uh, license to operate and, and our position in society. One of the ways we're doing that now is the, the Oil Search Health Foundation and it's one of the largest private sector services uh, providing health in the country right now. It's done using our own people. It's supported by major donors from, from overseas. It's working with and building the capacity of the Department of Health. And it's carrying out a range of programs, including HIV, AIDS management, malaria control, child maternal health, working across some nine provinces with plans to extend, expand further across the country. All search supports the government of Papua New Guinea's recent moves towards institutionalizing the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative as a means of ensuring the benefits of future economic growth are equitably distributed. The company has already been publishing information about how much they pay to various stakeholders. Important, and I'm pleased to say that the government recently adopted the uh, Extractive Industry Transparency Initiatives, which means that every six months they've got to say exactly where the money goes, who receives what, and let those people be accountable for, for what they're doing with that money. And we will pay our part in that. We're already publishing a lot of uh, material around where our money goes, how much we spend with each landowner company, how many people we employ, etc. Last year, the company invested $1.8 million in PNG, making it one of the largest investors in the country. This major investment signifies increased investor confidence in Papua New Guinea, brought about by the LNG project and political stability. However, Current shocks in the commodities markets and the downturn experienced in other resources sectors highlights the need for greater stability in government policy. Thank you, Thank you. We'll be back with more after the break. Early this year, InterOil and Pacific LNG Group announced that they had entered into exclusive talks with ExxonMobil to develop the Petroleum Retention License 15 PRL 15, which comprises the elk and antelope gas fields in the Gulf province. In this report, we find out the response from the Gulf provincial government. On the 24th of March this year, InterOil and Pacific LNG Group announced that they had entered into exclusive talks with ExxonMobil on the development of Petroleum Retention License 15, PRL 15. PRL-15 comprises of the elk and antelope gas fields in Gulf Province. Items to be considered during negotiations include the sale of an interest in PRL-15 to ExxonMobil, ExxonMobil's funding of InterOil and Pacific LNG, to drill additional delineation wells in the elk and antelope fields, and the option of InterOil and Pacific LNG developing a second LNG project in Gulf Province using gas from PRL-15 and other discoveries such as Triceratops. In response to these recent developments, the Gulf Provincial Government has taken a hard line over the exploitation of the gas in the province. Gulf Province, in its provincial assembly, passed a law that there is no pipeline policy meaning that everything that is found in Gulf Province remains in Gulf Province, processed, developed, and exported out of Gulf Province. And those are the positions that were given to the state and also to the developer. It's up to them now to decide whether they develop it in Gulf Province or otherwise. Uh, <clears throat> we understand that uh, Gulf the Gulf LNG project 
has the capacity to be a standalone project, which means developer, whoever that develops this project or operates this project, uh, should develop it <coughs> as a standalone project. And that's the position we are giving it in advance to the uh, Intel and ExxonMobil, reminding them that under the 2009 agreement, that is what we anticipated. So, yeah, uh, it is national government and uh, the state and the operator and the developer to, to come to a final decision. Uh, for Gao province, our position remains the same, unchanged, meaning that everything must happen in Gao province so that my people can benefit or enjoy maximum benefit and participation. What has been most striking, though, about this response is the alliance of Gulf's political and intellectual elite in a show of force. Uh, as uh, resource owners, uh, I think uh, we're bound to get a better deal on with uh, a team like this, with our experts sitting around us and politicians all sitting together. You can see the uh, proud uh, Gulf children here, mm -hmm. right behind me, John Loco, <coughs> Peter, uh, Peter Loco, former. Uh, Telecom, uh, CEO. Mr. Master, former CEO, to so Mr. Emmanuel Mai, Ori, former Deputy Secretary, Mr. Akia. Uh, if you see, both of us are very proud today because we are surrounded by the best brains of golf we have for the time now, for the moment, to, to guide us through. So we're not alone. Our technical team, we think, uh, have served this nation with distinctions. And those are the brains that are helping us to design a better package for golf tomorrow. On the sidelines of the press conference, there were whispers about whether or not the state had ownership rights to the resource. This discourse has obviously been reflected in the stance taken by the Minister for Labour and Industrial Relations. When asked whose side the minister would be on when push came to shove, the minister gave no doubt about where he stood. My loyalty lies with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with my people. They're the ones who gave me the mandate to fight them in parliament. Today I made up my, my, my loyalty lies. As a member of the Samara government that negotiated the PNG LNG project, Minister Mai Pakai was an insider watching the wheeling and dealing that culminated in the signing of the agreement. His current stance on the matters related to gas resources in his province reflects the lessons learned from the PNG LNG negotiations. Third party access is very, very important because if this is a standalone uh, standard gas field, a project that you cannot do it on its own because of the, uh, the lower gas content to, to, to make a stand around project. The third party access will allow the developer to pipe their gas product to an existing pipeline, pay tariff to end it up here. So those are very, very important things that the state has lost in the Exxon Mobil. It will not happen in the Gulf deal, I'm sorry to say this. And I will still fight in the cabinet if it means even risking myself. Minister Maipakai, of course, admits that he was not part of the Gulf Province team that went to Kokopo for the PNG LNG benefit sharing agreement talks. This may be an important lesson for the rest of Papua New Guinea. Since the Gulf Province leadership was divided, the province received a raw deal. In a year alone, uh, Gulf Province government only receives less than 10 million. Huh? Uh, it doesn't matter, you can't do much with that. For Papua New Guineans wondering what this means, the devil is in the detail. The PNG LNG project was initially estimated to cost about $15 billion, but a $4 billion cost blowout has meant that it will now cost $19 billion. Of the 22,000 construction jobs that were created, only 8,000 were filled by Papua New Guineans, while the remaining 14,000 jobs went to foreigners. Once construction ends by next year, most of those workers will be laid off with only about 1,500 retained. Landowner businesses were the biggest losers, scraping a mere $700 million in contracts, representing 3.7% of the total value of the project. This probably explains why the leaders of Gulf Province would like a better deal. Central to their demands is that the gas from Gulf Province is processed in the province in order to maximize the potential benefits. Now what we're trying to do is to make sure uh, you've seen the uh, project agreement signed in 2009 by Into Oil that Gulf LNG project uh, would be a standalone project. Uh, when we call it a standalone project, we want to see that uh, the developer and the operator develop the project wholly in Gulf province, which means 
the upstream part of the project, the midstream part of the project, and the downstream, all in a project. So we get three sectors of the benefit, all in Gulf province, so that our people can see and also participate in the benefit, uh, on the benefit of the project. The stance taken by the leaders of Gulf province perhaps reflects the rise of resource nationalism in Papua New Guinea, as seen in the move taken by the government to expropriate the giant Octedi copper mine. But these nationalist sentiments are not just confined to the resource sector, as reflected by the recent SME summit in Medang. Perhaps the days when Papua New Guineans are given the cone while someone else takes the cream are over. Uh, we were not prepared when we went to the UBSA. We were forced to accept what the state and the developer were able to offer us. So that's one of the reasons why we missed out. So what the Gulf Provincial Government is doing now with its technical team of Gulf uh, elites, we are putting the uh, cart before the horse. So we are now telling the state in Gulf Province, everything happened in Gulf Province. We are telling the state the most market obligation, the downstream plant must be built in Gulf Province. We are telling the state that you've already set a precedent in the first uh, project where you offloaded 4% or 5% to, uh, uh, to the landowners, uh, inclusive of the 2% uh, initially in the project agreements. So we are saying, okay, you set a precedent, also include another 5% from the state on free on carry. We join Gulf Governor Havila Kavo. That's next. Stay tuned. You're back with Resource PNG. In light of the developments of PRL 15, the Elk Antelope Project, we talk exclusively to Gulf Governor Havila Kavo about progress and updates surrounding the project. With the developments that are happening regarding PRL 15, the Elk Antelope Project in Gulf Province, the political leaders of the province have banded together. Could you give us some background about the process that was involved? Yeah, um, Gulf Province over the last couple of years, uh, leaders and uh, bureaucrats working in isolation and uh, uh, there was not really unity and so Gao province missed out on a lot of benefits in uh, previous uh, project agreements and so forth. Uh, with the new LNG project coming on board, uh, which is Gao LNG project, the leaders have uh, realized the failures in the previous project, have decided to band together. And uh, I am quite happy to say that the uh, uh, Minister for Labor, who is the uh, member for Kikori Open, Honorable Mark Lepakai, has come forward, uh, member for Kerema, has decided to come forward and we are now working together to ensure that this project, when initial stages of agreement uh, come, uh, put together, we want to see that Gao province uh, have maximum participation. We have decided to put our differences aside and put Gao province ahead of our own interests. Now, obviously the developer Inter Oil and ExxonMobil, the PNG LNG developer, are in talks at the moment and the province has decided to develop a position paper in respect to the PRL 15 uh, Elk Antelope project. What are some details could you give us with relation to the position paper that you presented to Interoil? The leaders, uh, we went ahead and uh, picked up a couple of the brains of the province, uh, which I've given them, uh, we've given them uh, the last three weeks to put the uh, paper together, uh, uh, looking at the contrast between the uh, PNG LNG one, and uh, making sure that we do not repeat the uh, the mistakes of the PNG LNG one uh, agreements, and uh, decided to capitalize on that and develop a new position. 
uh, we realized that we missed out on the first project because of the uh, political indifferences among the leaders themselves, ourselves. Uh, now what we're trying to do is to make sure uh, using the uh, project agreement signed in 2009 by Interoil that Gulf LNG project uh, would be a standalone project. Uh, when we call it a standalone project, we want to see that uh, the developer and the operator develop the project wholly in Gulf province, which means the upstream part of the project, the midstream part of the project, and the downstream, all in the project. So we get three sectors of the benefit all in Gulf province so that our people can see and also participate in the benefit, uh, on the benefit of the project. So what sort of benefits do you think the province would miss out on if the project was made part of the uh, TED train of the PNG LNG? There'll be a lot. Uh, as, uh, though we may be the host province to the LNG, Gulf LNG, but we will miss out on the plant part of the project where you have a downstream, uh, which is another 2% uh, of the project agreement, another project agreements, where you have 2% uh, upstream, 2% midstream, and 2% downstream. And downstream, if it's removed, it will be in central province, which means central province will pick, uh, pick up the 2% of that project agreement. So as a leader and uh, with my leaders, we decided to make sure we capture all of them and. Uh, have that benefit distributed uh, to the 10 uh, LLGs and uh, provinces who participate in the benefit. So, you know, uh, if in an event that uh, developer decides to uh, bulldoze, uh, I, I, I am, <laughs> I, am uh, uh, I still maintain my position as a leader that despite of whatever they say, we still insist that developer can still, or operator can still develop the project in Gao province. We understand the, uh, the shortfall in the gas supply to the uh, first uh, PNG LNG project, where ExxonMobil is uh, needing extra more gas to meet up to its requirements in the agreements that uh, it is ended with uh, uh, different buyers all over the world. Uh, because of that reason, they want to take more, one more train to meet up to that requirement. But as a leader, I say that, you know, they can still make it up elsewhere from uh, reserves, maybe in South Highlands or maybe in Hell or whatever. Gulf LNG must then as a standalone project and be developed separately. More of this interview after the break. Thanks for staying with us on the show. We continue the interview with the Governor of Gulf, Javi Lakavo. In the event that it becomes a commercial decision between ExxonMobil and Interoil, and the state supports that commercial decision, how, what will be the response of the Gulf provincial <coughs> government with regard to that? Will you be, what sort of cost of action are you going to be considering? You know, provincial government, uh, beginning of this year, uh, made a law, uh, provincial legislation. Uh, we decided to make a law to restrict uh, export of any natural resources from Gao province in any ports in Papua New Guinea. Rather, everything happened in Gao province, and that became a law. And so that law is now being put together with our position paper. Uh, in that position paper, we are reminding Interoil of its initial project agreement with Gao province, uh, inclusive of uh, domestic uh, market obligation. Uh, the gas that they have is sufficient to develop a project on its own. You know, another project, Gao LNG project, is a project on its own. You cannot match it with already an existing uh, project, which is a project on its own. Uh, you know, there is a risk of what we call a monopoly by one player. Uh, I'm saying this with a caution, but you know, uh, it's a it's a it's dangerous train. If state uh, will try to accept the uh, commercial uh, arrangement, uh, it will be a it will be a risk for this country if states agrees 
uh, uh, to give the project away to ExxonMobil, then we will find out that ExxonMobil become the most major player in any energy developments in a country. Then we begin to realize that it becomes monopoly. Yeah, he can monopolize the whole industry, and we want to avoid that as much as possible. I believe state, in its wisdom, would not make that stupid mistake. With regards to the benefits that you've received under the current PNG LNG one, are you satisfied with those benefits and how might you use the current discussions over PRL 15 to leverage benefits in the future? The only benefit we get from the, uh, from the first project is just the uh, infrastructure development grants of which uh, we get them out. 2% of the 28% to three provinces on the coastline, which is Western Gulf and Central, while 72% of all the benefit remains in Southern Highlands. And provincial government only receives, it's also a part stake a beneficiary to that uh, infrastructure development grants and other, other, other project gra grants that are given. But in a year alone, the uh, provincial government only receives less than 10 million. Huh? Uh, you, know, see, you can't do much with that because uh, you've got a lot of infrastructure that you want to develop. You can't do it with just 10 million. But uh, in a, because of that, uh, that uh, uh, limitations in the uh, kind of uh, benefits we are receiving, you know, we realize that if we, we don't develop a position now, we will, f we will miss out on the uh, maximum part of the benefit sharing, you know. So we realize that. That's why we're coming up with a position to say that we make sure uh, everything in contained in the project agreement, Gulf province want to benefit from with that. Given that the discussions between ExxonMobil and uh, Interoil have been given a deadline of by the end of this year, <coughs> do, you, do you think that the Gulf provincial government has started counting its chickens before the eggs hatch. Yeah, you're quite correct in that way, you know. We already started because we know exactly, with the position paper that we are given, we know exactly what we want out of this project. Uh, we can't just sit back and uh, wait until the UBSA, uh, which happened in the uh, PNG LNG project where uh, we were not prepared when we went to the UBSA. We were forced to accept what the state and the developer were able to offer us. So that's one of the reasons why we missed out. So what the Gulf provincial government is doing now with its technical team of Gulf uh, elites, we are putting the uh, cart before the horse. So we are now telling the state in Gulf province, everything happened in Gulf province. We are telling the state the most market obligation, the downstream plant must be built in Gulf province. We are telling the state that you've already set a precedent in the first uh, project where you offloaded 4% or 5% to uh, uh, to the landowners, uh, inclusive of the 2% uh, initially in the project agreements. So we are saying, okay, you said a president, also include another 5% from the state on free on carry. Okay, we are also being reminded during the first agreement uh, between Intel and the state, where the project agreement was signed in 2009, where Intel and New Guinea Gas wanted to offload 50% of the project to the state, which NEC accepted it. Uh, I'm told just this week that uh, uh, New Guinea Energy and uh, Intel have decided to withdraw that offer when NEC has already accepted it and, uh, uh, and uh, we are anticipating that 27.5 uh, additional is added to 22.5 to make it 50%, the state owns 50% of the project which was a good offer and Intel did very well in making that offer. But I'm sad to say that they withdraw that in the last hour, which is not going on very well with the state. But in the event that they come back again and say, sure, we'll give it back to you, then Gulf Province can negotiate for something better out of it. Uh, what as uh, province of government, we are trying to make sure that whatever uh, uh, percentage that is given to us, we want state to give it us, not on commercial terms, but free on carry. Uh, we have a problem with the first project where Southern Highlands was given another 5% on top of the 2%. And then they, are, uh, uh, they have to find some money to pay for it on commercial terms, which is uh, a lot of burden to the provincial government. But the good news to them is the state has decided to carry them in a, uh, in a just recently, and he had made a decision.
More from Governor Kavo when we return. Welcome back. As we continue the interview with Governor for Gulf Province, Havila Kavo, we find out Mr. Kavo's view regarding the state's decision to consolidate its resources under the Kumul Holdings. You obviously now had a meeting with the uh, Government Relations Manager for Insta Oil, Mr. Isikel Taureka. Are there any plans for, uh, for meeting with the uh, state nominee for the project, Petromi, or in the future, whoever comes under Kumul Holdings? A uh, state nominee is, uh, is a nominee of the state, uh, which has a uh, stake in the project. Uh, they actually were part of the project developers. Uh, uh, in the, when, the, when the project comes to a conclusion, especially when the state awards them the uh, final investment decision, then we will be able to sit with the state's team and decide how best we can, we can work together amicably so that state plus the provincial government and landowners uh, are fairly represented in a project uh, participation. Uh, at the moment, uh, we haven't really sat with the uh, with state nominee as yet. But let me uh, remind you that in, in the position that we are developing, uh, we've seen that Southern Highlands uh, landowners and provincial governments uh, equity is being carried, dividend or equity is being uh, carried on by state nominee, which is uh, MRDC. In our position, which we are presenting to the state, we want state to give that to a provincial government's nominee to manage it rather than MRDC because if MRDC carries it, it's got too many, you know, eggs in a basket to carry. And it cannot carry the mining project, the landowners, Kudubu landowner projects, Heights landowner projects, and, uh, and uh, uh, Gulf landowners, and Gulf provincial government and Southern Highlands provincial government, Central provincial government, all of them have been carried because state has nominated MRDC to manage their benefits. So we are proposing in our position to the state that provincial government and landowners equity must be managed by a nominee nominated by the provincial government. Now with relation to <coughs> obviously state nominee MRDC, uh, it's going to perhaps be taken up under the whole Kumul holding structure. Yes. What is the Gulf provincial government's view about the state's move to uh, consolidate its uh, resource assets under Kumul holdings? That's something that we're yet to, uh, yet to look at in just making sure that uh, the structure that is set up by the uh, state, uh, will it uh, be the best structure to manage and uh, manage the uh, assets and uh, benefits of the provincial government and the landowners. Once we identify that it's uh, able to manage that, then we will consider. Otherwise, provincial government will be making a, a, a proposition to the state that we, uh, we appoint our nominee to manage our benefits. Stay tuned for more after this break. To end tonight's show, here is Martin Namarong with the Resource News Update. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Resource PNG News and Analysis. I'm Martin Namarong. Perhaps the biggest news in the resource sector has been Prime Minister O'Neill's visit to the Octedi mine. His visit comes at a time when the state intends to expropriate the mine from its majority shareholder, the Papua New Guinea Sustainable Development Programme. The Prime Minister announced during his trip to Tabubil that Octedi mine workers will be paid out the entitlements in full by the end of this year. However, such a major announcement would need the approval of the Octedi Mining Limited Board headed by Chairman Sam Ekaram Morauta. It is therefore interesting that despite promising an independent board and management, the government is already showing signs of interfering in the running of Octedi Mining Limited. Semekere Morata, who is chairman of OTML, is also the chairman of its majority shareholder PNGSDP. In June this year, Semekere Morata called for constructive dialogue with the government over the future of the mine. 
at stake is the future of Octedi Mining Limited, a company estimated to be worth 1.3 billion US dollars. Another industry player, Barrick, continues to face problems overseas. Its shareholders recently filed a lawsuit against the company regarding disclosures related to its Pascualama project in Chile. The Chilean courts have also fined Barrick $16 million for very serious violations of its environment permit. Barrick shares have plummeted in recent times as a result of these actions. It is within this context that Treasurer Don Polia stated in the Treasury's media fiscal outlook that the impact of the commodities downturn has led to a reduction in mineral and petroleum taxes to the tune of 239 million kina in 2013. Adding to this is a budget deficit that is projected to be 2.7 billion kina, an increase of 150 million kina from what was initially estimated. The mining and quarrying sector growth has been revised up to 20% from the 2013 budget focus of 17.8%. This upward revision is forward-looking and does not reflect on the current state of the mining sector. The Treasurer also highlighted that mining employment grew by 3.8% through the year to the end of the March quarter. Whilst there was significant growth in the second half of 2012, this has been reversed in the first quarter of 2013 due to the downturn experienced by the industry. This recent decline in employment reflects major mines looking at cost-cutting measures for their operations following the fall in the commodity prices. The impact of the commodities downturn has been negative on Papua New Guinea's balance of payments. The balance of payments refers to the balance between how much the country exports and how much it imports. In the March quarter of 2013, the current account deficit was 1.265 billion. The LNG project, on the other hand, has progressed well following cost adjustments. It is 80% complete and on schedule for delivery of first gas by the end of next year. On a more positive note, after six years of hearings, Ramo mine land cases are finally about to conclude with declarations of landowners imminent. There is also more good news for Papua New Guinea's businesses with the launch of a new supplier database. The database was launched recently by Community Development Minister Lujaya Tony at the Institute of Banking and Business Management Awards Night. The IBBM Awards recognize Papua New Guinean businesses that have excelled in various aspects of doing business in the country. After the launching, Minister Tony highlighted that the need for capacity building and empowerment of Papua New Guineans to participate meaningfully in the economic development of the country was imperative. Her sentiments were shared by Commerce and Industry Minister Richard Maru, who announced major policy and legislative efforts to increase participation of Papua New Guineans in the business sector. The IBBM Awards were sponsored by the PNG LNG project, which had established the IBBM Enterprise Center as a means of building the capacity of local suppliers and contractors to the LNG project. Meanwhile, the Gulf Provincial Government recently presented a position paper to the Minister for Petroleum and Energy, William Duma, regarding the future of the gas reserves in the province. The Gulf Province wants all gas processed within the province. This presentation to Mr. Duma follows an earlier presentation to Inter Oil. In his response, Mr. Duma stated that the government has given a 108-day notice to Inter Oil to show cause as to why it cannot execute the terms of a 2009 agreement with the government. Whilst on the subject of the Department of Petroleum and Energy, the department has been the subject of a lot of discussion on social media for all the wrong reasons. Allegations are being raised about corruption and mismanagement at the Department of Petroleum and Energy and whether it is best serving the industry and the people of Papua New Guinea. Finally, as PNG's resource sector grows, communities whose livelihoods are founded on the land are dealing with the challenge of giving up the very foundation of their societies for cash. It is therefore timely that the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous People has issued a report on extractive industries. The report focuses on issues related to the extractive industries and implications that they may have on the rights of Indigenous peoples. 
In the report, the Special Rapporteur systematically sets forth a series of observations and recommendations regarding models of natural resource development, the obligations of state, the responsibilities of companies, consultation processes, and the principle of free, prior, and informed consent to protect the rights of indigenous peoples within the context of the challenges posed by extractive industries on a global scale. The report will be presented to the Human Rights Council next month. That's all we have time for tonight. Thank you for viewing. Have a pleasant evening. That ends this edition of Resource PNG. If you have any comments or queries, do email us on this address, resourcepng at mtv.com.pg. Or to find out more, check MTV online. That's www.mtv.com.pg. And go to our Resource PNG page. Or you can check our page on Facebook. Until the same time next week, bye for now.